Hi, I'm Oliver Lennon, and welcome to the Sendale podcast, uh, where we delve into all things conversational AI with some of the sharpest brains from some of the most innovative companies in the world of customer experience. Um, these are not a series of interviews, but conversations, um, regular discourse designed to provoke, educate, and enlighten the business professionals with insights, learning, and guidance on leveraging conversational AI to deliver meaningful CI. With me today, folks, I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Pike, an Englishman living in Northern California, herding 26 goats, I think he is, cycling around the streets of San Jose, um, and in his spare time, does a little bit with Vern. Talking a lot about large language models, um, as everyone is today. Um, um, some really good storytelling from Matt, specifically simplifying some of the stuff that's happening in the likes of OpenAI. And a good analogy, really, I guess, from an LLM, uh, comparing it to what Apple did for app development, which has really created a framework to allow many innovations and many ideas to spawn from that, which I think, uh, which is really happening or starting to happen with LLM. So really good discussion around that. Um, if you're into cycling, have a listen to Matt and what he's trying to do on the on the track. Um, well, let's not worry about his flight fall the day before we recorded this. Um, good conversation. Hope you enjoy it. Matt Pike, good morning. Um, it is good morning. Uh, you're in Northern California. It reminds me of uh, Baz Luhrmann's song, uh, Sunscreen. Sunscreen, do you remember it? Or you're, you are old I enough. do remember Sunscreen. Yeah, the um, spoken word is, song from Baz Luhrmann. Yeah, I remember that. Yes, so live in Nor Northern California once and leave before it makes you stop. So um, you, you're at least there once. So an Englishman living in Northern California, herding goats and racing criterion, here to talk about AI. So Matt, how are you? Do you want to give me a little bit of background? I'm interested in the goats particularly. We'll pick up on a little uh, yeah. bit of the cy cycling as well as we meander <laughs> through this conversation, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't mind giving you a bit of background at all. We, we moved to California about eight years ago. Um, and uh, believe it or not, it's not always sunny in California. It is actually foggy this morning. Um, but that aside, the goats, that came about because when my kids started school here, they have something here called FFA, which is Future Farmers of America. And we didn't, we didn't know what that was. We, 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 we had no clue. And uh, as it turns out, there's a farm at the school and you can, you can buy an animal and you can uh, you raise the animal and it teaches the kids about profit and loss and how to run a business and they have to track everything that they buy for the animal and then they set, they take it to the county fair and they sell it and so my kids went through I think we did pigs we did steers we did all sorts and then my youngest daughter kind of got into a goat and it was like okay well, what do you do with a goat <laughs> well turns out they're quite popular in 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 food dishes because <laughs> they're a meat goat <laughs> anyway so she uh she uh she got into this goat she sold it and it, it made her quite a bit of money she made a profit at, at the fair and we thought okay well you know 22 dollars a pound we can we, we can work with this and goats aren't very big they're only like 80 pounds 100 pounds if you're lucky and so she she started buying her own goats and we we found a place to keep them and then we found out you can't just buy one goat you have to buy more than one goat because they're social animals much like humans, they need to be in, in contact with each other. So you, you can't buy one goat and then, or two goats, and then leave one behind. You have to buy companion goats. So we bought Joey and Waddles, our two Nigerian dwarfs who, who've been with us for eight years now. And they, 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 they are the companion goats. Anyway, she started this thing and, you know, several years later, we've now got 23 goats and she makes thousands of dollars selling them back out to people to, uh, to, to, for, for meat and to show and to do everything else. And, I end up with a freezer full of goat a couple of times a year that I can slow cook in the gut, in, in the barbecue. So, so yeah, it's all good. Who needs AI when you can herd goats in, North, in Northern <laughs> California? It definitely sounds like the lifestyle. I think I'm missing something, Matt, you know, sitting in rainy, well, uh, in rainy Belfast most of the time. Well, it, get, it gets worse with the goats. And, and um, because when I say I, AI at home, it means something different when you're breeding goats. <laughs> I understand, and I'm not going to go into that on this <laughs> podcast. It might put some delicate minds so. off. It might, but you know, you you have to balance it out when you're talking when when you're talking to everybody about AI and 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 what I do and AI and what they do, and 
it makes for interesting conversation at the table. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Um, there's a few other things we'll pick up as we go through. I mean, we're we're actually sure. recording this podcast in mid-May, and the Giro started uh, like six or seven yep. days ago. Um, and one of the favorites pulled out about two days ago. Um, so I know you've had a little bit of a, an issue with your cycling recently, but we'll pick that up in a minute. We'll not, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll not spend too long Just talking about goats, about goats and cycling. Um, the engagement capacity gap. So yes, if, I were to type that into, gap. If, I, yep. if I were to type that into chat GPT4 and say engagement capacity, capacity gap, Explain that to me in layperson's terms. What what would a retract report with? So I, ideally, it would come back with variant because it's a it's a term that we've coined after a lot of research. So essentially, the the engagement capacity gap comes from looking at the customer engagement industry um, and realizing that the customer engagement industry and, and it's bigger than customer engagement workforce and it's bigger than the contact center. But essentially, companies spend worldwide $2 trillion on industry labor to basically engage with customers. And technology spend within that is about $65 billion. So it's, it's, it's a lot of money involved in trying to solve the customer engagement. And what it comes down to is there's been a big shift to digital and, and trying to drive the customer service expectations higher you know so there's 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 consumer they've got elevated expectations there's flexible omni-channel journeys that everybody can jump into and then there's the workforce that have to serve all of those things that as we know are getting you know connected to um uh, you know uh, ai and bots and 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 working from home and, and everything else that goes with it what it really comes down to from a from a engagement capacity gap is there's a finite amount of time. We're not going to get any more unless somebody creates a new calendar for some reason or another. We're, we're, we're kind of stuck where, we are, where we're at, we're orbiting around the sun. Time is, a, is, is kind of a constant. Mm -hmm. Customer expectations are skyrocketing, as we mentioned, through all of this spend that, cust that companies have of trying to solve these, these, these problems and, and implementing different technologies and different people and across all these different spaces. But there's a finite amount of budget and resources for these companies to actually achieve those customer expectations. And so the engagement capacity gap is where Verant sits, which is closing those elevated expectations from the consumers um, to align to the budgets and resources within the time constraints that you have. So balancing the workforce that you have in, in, in you know, serving those customers, um, making sure it works within the timeframes and the budget constraints and, and resources that you, you've, you've got available, whilst also blending the automated and the AI-based technologies to, to enhance that experience, not only for the customers in, in having that experience, but also the workforce in serving those customers. So the entire engagement becomes, um, becomes a thing, essentially, and, and we close that gap down. It's probably an elongated answer to the first question that you asked me, but it, it's a it's a complex problem, and we've been you know people have been trying to solve it for years in customer yeah. service, and, and we think we've got the tools and the functions within Verant platform to to be able to close that gap down. So you've mentioned Verant there, and again, I, I know you give me your your, 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 <laughs> your goat your goat herding background is brilliant. Um, you've been in Verant, um, and again. For our listeners who maybe don't know, you can give me a little snapshot of Vern, but you've been in Vern for sure. whatever, six, seven, eight years. Prior to that, you worked in something called Cana um, for quite a number yep. of years as well. So you've been floating around this uh, industry in terms of customer contact, customer experience. Um, so you've probably seen many of these, I guess, similar problems that we've been trying to solve for, for a number of years. You've probably seen new technologies yep. come along, some of them work, some of them don't work, and we're kind of um, been chatting to people quite recently about this. I think we're, are we at another one of these, you know, technology has come again, we're going to solve some bits and pieces. But give me a little bit of background about yourself in terms of, of where you work sure. and, and what you've been doing. And, and I suppose, Vernon, and I know we've got to know each other more recently, but the partnership that we've been forming between Sunday and Vernon, we, we'll maybe pick a little bit of that up towards the end as well. Yep. So, yeah, so I work for uh, Karna Software. I joined early 2000s. Dot, dot com bubble was about to burst, I think, was when I joined. So it was a, it was a good move for me, apparently. Um, but it, 
they focus primarily initially, and, and again, it comes down to the technologies and as you say, things rolling out, right? So every technology started with voice, everybody had voice and, and, and you know, lots of companies have, have built on, on voice from there. When I started Kana, it was um, email was the, the next big thing, right? Everybody's going to communicate on email. This was just before the rise of BlackBerry, which is coming out soon as a, as a, a mockumentary film, whatever it's going to be. But um, so customer service on email, um, you know, that was where marketeers were starting to find out they could send messages out and, and that was part of my speciality. And then as we, as we went through, that grew pretty rapidly into another channel that kind of started coming along, which was self-service people trying to figure out how to self-serve to um to to reduce the escalations or, or we called it de-escalation and and channel shopping back then you know people trying to pick the right channel to get the right answer and you know trying all these different things they tried voice they tried the email they'll try the website trying to figure out what they were trying to do and so we we built the um, knowledge management solutions and then that evolved into well, how do I escalate my request from a self-service knowledge into the contact center again? So it's contact forms, trying to make them intelligent, trying to, you know, take the form, fill it in. And as you fill in the form in, knowledge would appear in contextual knowledge on the right-hand side and, and so on. So we, we pioneered some of that. And, and then we, um, we got into the escalation part, so live chat. And so all of these things start to come together. And, and, and my tenure at Kana was was support and, and professional services of implementing these things and advising customers on, on the best practices to do and, and how to streamline their, their engagement processes. And um, about 10 years ago, maybe less, Veron acquired Kana and I'd moved from support, professional services to sales consulting, to just getting into product management and, and starting to build consolidated applications of all these different functions and technologies to try and solve customer experience into one place. And it was funny because it was all of these technologies coming together that kind of, if you look back, it was kind of like, this is the CCAS world we have now, right? It's a, it's a desktop with all of these channels and omni-channel and, and switch between the different um, things and the customers. But there were very distinct start, start points. Um, as people were realizing as the internet kind of grew and I've shown my age now and remember the internet started. Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, I don't tell other people about that, but uh, as the internet grew, people started realizing they needed to connect to all these different things and, 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 and serve their customers. And, and going through Kana and Veron became quick, you know, quick to recognize that you can build all of the inflection channels and, and pull them all together for an agent. And, and for Veron's purposes, you know, we, they do, and, and again, I, I joined through an acquisition of Kana and, and I got to know the platform uh, really, really well, but workforce management, you know, call recording, quality, compliance, everything and anything you can think of to manage a contact center there is in the basket of, of Veron. And I worked in the product management space and I got to know a lot of the product managers and, and help implement some of the, the technologies to link these things together and, and, and pull it up so that our customers could benefit from the fact that we can help you manage these things. And, and, and that's kind of where we lead into the engagement capacity gap because we can close that gap down, right? So um, for me, I don't think technology is going to come and go. Technology is always going to come because voice is still really popular. People, believe it or not, people do like to talk, regardless of what my daughters will tell me when they're texting on the phone, they, they still like to talk. But there is a shift in the balance of how many interactions go through a voice versus how many now go through, say, a, a chat component, which again is is you know immediate answers to problems which is those elevated expectations from the consumer and yeah. it kind of all just maps together all right so um and when we did the live chat we, we tried to put this is way before bots and ai i'm going to caveat that to start with but one of the one of the prototypes we built was pushing contextual knowledge through chat into the chat channel to try and deflect users from actually contacting us in the first place and this was way before conversational AI. It was way before uh, chatbots were a thing. And we were kind of going through this and people kind of looked at us a bit funny. I remember those days going into meetings and people were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is crazy. Um, I was like, oh, this is going to be a thing. Uh, um, and then a few years later, yeah, um, chatbots started coming out and then conversational AI you know, comes to evolve and, and, and everything else. And I, I don't think any of these technologies are ever going to go away just simply because yeah. When we, we talk, we're talking now, it's voice, that's, that's what we're going to do. We can improve it, um, and we do lots of different things, you know, fraud compliance and 
call risk scoring, all of the other fun things that go with that. But when you say, you know, conversation, I, is it a new fad? I, I think it's going to be a, just a new, a new normal, I think is probably the, the right way to put it. And with the explosion of LLMs and all of the other fun things that come with it, it's people are getting used to what they are. I, I was thinking about the Alexas in my house, actually. Yeah. when I was coming out to do this this morning and five years ago it was like oh an Alexa this is this is a novelty I'm trying to be careful because I forgot to mute mine so uh, I'm trying to say it quietly <laughs> but uh, um, my kids use it all the time I use it when I walk in I have a um, one of the uh, one of the ones with the screen so as I walk oh, in yeah. it comes on yeah. so it, did, it yeah, detects me when I come in and it tells me the weather it gives me the news and it flashes up recipes and um it just be, it just it's just become an integral part of where it sits in the middle of the kitchen of, of, of the morning and i don't think i would get rid of it but it's just it's just there now so yeah um, and it's in interesting yeah. I, did anyway, read sorry, some, rambling. I, I did read no no you're fine i read something about the alexa <laughs> and was in one of amazon's greatest uh sunk holes or sink holes so to speak in terms of the investment and the return um but yeah. i you know, in terms of the adoption of it, and yes, when that five, six, seven years when that first comes to the market, it was going to revolutionise home with it. It probably hasn't, um, but I, again, the technology has evolved. I suppose um, whether the use cases. So, which I'm, I'm where I'm leading here. You know, is this, and I think the Alexa or Google Home, whichever one picks, whatever piece of technology or hardware is your choice. Um, was kind of like a, a technology looking for a problem um, or a solution looking for a problem. And yes, it has helped. Um, I'm just wondering, are we kind of getting to that again with, with LLMs? Or do you think there is something that's going to change the world um, or change the world as we know it? Well, yeah, I mean, the LLMs are interesting because... LLMs are just create a, are a kind of a, almost like a baseline in, in my opinion, right? And then I was I was um, I don't know if you know the guy that you know the grandfather of GPT OpenAI is is talking at Congress at the moment, um, and yeah. he's talking about the fact that there's going to be there's there's a point at which there's only so much you can so much so much data you can give an LLM before you have to start thinking about how it can learn and what it can do, and that was kind of the attraction of the LLM is. You can put it on the in, you give it to the internet, right? So the you know the internet connected information, which is generally what it was used for, as opposed to what we tend to use it for now, which is log communication. Uh, um, but having that infinite set of data to create a language model from is, is is pretty cool, and you can create a language model from it. What's what I think it needs to evolve to next is yes, I agree that you don't you shouldn't have to have a large language model to train it. Hence the L in the first LLM, right? Is you need to figure out how it can learn from smaller data sets that may be in context. And that's the other thing is mm -hmm. LLMs are great for a system to understand how to compose language, which is why you can type certain things into it and it will come back with a great big long yep. document, which may not mean much to a human reader, yep. <laughs> but or, it thinks or, it's brilliant. Or indeed maybe incorrect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I tried to tell it a joke the other day. It was... Um, what, what do you call what do you call a magician that's lost his magic? It's Ian. What it gave me was a description of a magician when it's when they can't do magic. It's like, well, you kind of lost the concept of of the joke in in asking it that question. So you're not you're not you're not going to become a stand up comedian, Matt, if you don't mind me saying. So I'm not just like that. <laughs> Well, in the cycling community, one of, there's a group of friends we have, and, and, and my tag is actually dad jokes. So it's, uh, it's kind of a thing. <laughs> but that aside, uh, uh, the, uh, um, yeah, I think it comes down to you've got to, you've got to figure out you want to create a language model that it can learn how to, how to speak, right? And that's, that's what LLMs have done for us. It's, it's teaching the machines actually how to construct a sentence, what it can do, and, and so on. The context is going to come from the smaller... I'm going to say niche players, but the smaller vendors, you know, I'm not, we're not as big as open API I'd like to be, but I'm going to say niche players that can create or use those LLMs in the context that they're designed for. So we, we have something called Vera and DaVinci, which is our AI tools and services that companies can, can, can use and, 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 and um, connect to through, through our APIs. We use them in our own products, obviously, but we also make them open in our open platform. But the, the idea there is, we have the experience in customer service, customer engagement, 
to direct these language models and this this AI into the right space. With a large language model, there is no direction, right? You, you have to rely on all of that. Now, what I think the LMs are good for are creating a, an ecosystem of businesses around all of those things to help direct those that, that that technology rather than LLMs being the answer to a problem that nobody asked was a problem, I suppose. It's, Correct. Right. Uh, is what it comes down to. So, it, like, like, like you said, like the the Alexas and everything, and the Googles and everything else. You you create these things because, and I'm going to go back to even even Apple. They they created a thing that generated a whole ecosystem of 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 apps that you can launch, and it's essentially just an app launcher in your hand that you can hold businesses. But you can't do it without the, the core device. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that started a whole whole different era of how to get consumable content into into people's hands and i think it's going to be the same for the yellow lenses here's here's a baseline of i'm going to say science project <laughs> which it has been for eight or nine years i've been i've been trying to plug the open ai stuff into our stuff for, for a long time and then end of last year it just exploded and i was like yeah. yep there it is <laughs> here it comes the, the the light, the light of, on. Uh, yeah exactly and i think it's because they built uh an interface that was consumable by anybody rather okay, than yeah. consumable by developers, right? So and I've had I'm, I'm personal experience, I've had this problem before where I've tried to explain a concept and as a product manager, you do this all the time. You, you try and create a concept in your head, you explain it out and people don't quite get it until they can see something tangible and you can create PowerPoints and you can do presentations and you can do everything else. But until they actually see something working, then they go, ah, oh, that's what it is. I think it's been yeah. the same for a lot of it. Yeah, there's, a, there's a doing. concept I've come across or been chatting recently about called thinkism. I and mean, I think this is an, a, an ideal scenario. Some even on our own roadmap, we're doing it from there. But there's a lot of thinkism to be done as in, you know, how could we use, <laughs> let's say, this scenario in LLM and you come up with all the theories. But until you actually combine thinkism with doing it or showing it in a practical sense, then thinkism is only a part it's an important part don't get me wrong you have to think of the yep. theory and how, how you might manipulate it or how you might use it sorry but it's actually applying you know in an agile or in any way it's, it's actually iterating through concepts and showing and actually doing um, and i think when you combine thinkism with and i'm not sure what the doing ism if there's the right uh, answer <laughs> i like doing ism you should coin that phrase you should coin that phrase thinkism and doing ism i think that'll be a new strap line <laughs> Um, but I, I think combining those two, and you're absolutely right. I mean, what OpenAI via ChatGPT brought to the market was, and, and similarly, I mean, we had been looking at this, you know, 12, 14 months ago. I think, yes, there's a really good model there, but, you know, would it ever come to life? But now the human race has seen it. Um, and yep. just funny, when you were chatting there about the early days of Hannah and uh, well, it was early days of Canada and email management. I was listening to something at the weekend. It was a utility provider in the UK, and uh, the CEO was on. It was on one of the national effects on a politics show he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think something like in the last three months, 85% of their email has now been handled by uh, an open uh, uh, chat GPT, I think, or well, whether it, well, it was their LLM yeah. or whatever. But um, so, you know, that challenge that you probably thought about. 20 years ago, how do we handle emails and how do we manage the process and the workflow around that? Quite possibly something like an LLM would, you know, short circuit that radically compared to what we were thinking around even five or even yeah. three years ago. Yeah, I mean, that was what we built. We, we built, um, it was it was rule automations, essentially. You know, a business user would sit there and they would they would be able to interrogate the inbound request and 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 map out a, a flow of where they wanted the email to land and how you could scale it well with an with an llm or a gpt or any gen generative ai you could you can look at that content coming in and, and you can do several different things you can one pretend to be an agent and we had auto replies but they were pre-built templates well now yeah. with llm you can get it to build the template on the fly yeah well but you need to direct it into the context that you want so building a template on the fly to answer a utilities versus a a telco could uh, be very different. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I I agree, and I do like the analogy you have. For time I've heard it, so you can trademark it. The Apple analogy, which is you know it, it's a platform or a framework which will form, you know many many 
companies, many innovations, many ideas that will take advantage of an LLM. And yep. I think what we're seeing now in the market as well, it's, it's not the LLM. It's, you will have multiple hundreds, if not thousands of these. Now, maybe it's an oxymoron to say uh, you have thousands of large language models, but I think you'll have certainly many iterations of those. And, and um, I think so. You know, certainly in this space of uh, the engagement gap and um, customer experience, it's putting the guide rails around those LLMs, as you articulated, that's the important thing. Um, but you can't, yep. you know, by definition, you're not going to retrain that model because you just won't have the compute power to do that on a regular basis. But if you can shape and guideline, put the guidelines around it, I think it would be important um, for, for driving experience. Definitely. I mean, I, I... I was reading an article the other day that it's uh, the financial compliance industry that they want to use it, but they're hesitant to <laughs> because they've got so many compliance and guideline issues to to compete with. So they're doing it for things they don't need that for, but not necessarily for the things they want to use it for. So it, it's it's a thing. It's going to yeah. be a, a bigger thing <laughs> for sure. And, and again, you know, tying it back to that in, engagement capacity gap, because it's now, I don't know, I'm interested in your opinion, and that's certainly what I'm saying, is expectations now, both at a consumer level and uh, an enterprise level, so, the, you know, the, the organizations that both mm -hmm. you and I sell to, expectations have suddenly exploded radically in the oh, last yeah. three, six months, that all of a sudden we've got an LLM, and that, um, you know, engagement capacity gap is going to go to zero, pretty much. <laughs> Are you saying yeah. that? And, and again, how do you th how do you think that's going to play out as well? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think the gap is going to go to zero. I think people are. Again, it comes down to because people are now aware of it, they're hoping it's going to fix all their problems for you. But there's never a silver bullet for customer engagement because uh, as soon as a, as soon as a new technology comes along, somebody comes up with a new question to ask and how to how to connect to uh, um, the company and, and what they're going to ask it. So one of the things we've always strived for, even before LLMs were popular and, and knowledge was there, was always answer the simple stuff in an automated fashion and the complex stuff you need somebody to actually be involved with and, and get answers. Now, if you can dig into the more complex stuff with the LLMs, for sure, that's going to reduce it, but it's never going to close the gap. Because again, the more people that are aware of this and the more people get comfortable with using these types of solutions, they're going to have more and more questions. So the, the gap is still going to be there. The expectations are still going to be up. Um, and, and I will say, I think one of the things about skyrocketing expectations and, and people forget is, and I'm going to back to BlackBerry again because BlackBerry is one of my favorite ones, is it changed the way email worked. Before, email was like a letter, and that's how it was built. Yeah, right? yeah. And it's got an envelope. It's got, you know, you write it. And, and, and the expectation was you'd send an email, then you would wait two or three days before you got a response. How many people send an email and then are looking at their watch like a minute later? Why haven't they responded yet? Because I have it on my phone. I have it um, on my device. I'm always connected. And it's almost, email is almost like the, and I've said this to other people before, email is like the grandfather of chat. It's the same concept, but it's just, it wasn't supposed to be instant, but now everybody treats it like that because they ended up having these Blackberries in their hands. And that was kind of the reason. Then, then all of the other devices came out, which kind of what killed that. But you could almost equate that to, you could equate to MP3 players, Blackberries. They were the first, but they were not the most successful. So yeah. that's what's going to happen. And expectations may change, but I don't think the gap's going to get any smaller. They're just going to be different expectations or different questions. And, and the LLM is going to be there, but they, they've done it in the right way, I think, which is creates a platform that they can then create stuff on top of, which yeah. is maybe what Sony didn't do with the Walkman, maybe what Blackberry didn't do with the Blackberry. But the concept kind of grew out and, and everybody adopted it in a slightly different way, but a more consumable way to make it faster and so on. So even, even for me, right. I'm, when I've got um, something I want to do, my expectations are not changing. I'm just using lots of different channels to get it done. Whether that's being done faster, that's one thing, whether it's being done correctly, that's another, yeah. <laughs> uh, but if it can be done correctly and faster, then I'm all in. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of laughing at your, you're right, the analogy about the emails, you know, and I remember my first job email didn't actually exist. <laughs> I remember applying for my first job um, in, in a tech company, and I'm not going to tell you when this was, but it was way before yeah. dot to dot com. 
and um, writing letters back and forth to the then MD of the company of whether I should accept and, and trying to negotiate my salary via letter, which was an interesting, <laughs> an interesting <laughs> approach. Um, but we, yeah. we mentioned the, you know, the expectation on email. And I think you get, I've seen getting caught in this sort of vicious downward spiral of, you, some, you know, someone sends you an email and then whatever, you know, 30 seconds or a couple of minutes later, you get a message, message in Slack. I've just sent you the email. Did you get it? <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, um, that one I don't get. <laughs> and then you, uh, you send an email back to them saying, yes, I got your Slack message about your email in Slack. And I'm not sending this email back to say that I read your Slack message. Exactly. <laughs> so, See, the volume have, hasn't changed. It's gone up. Have I done anything in those 30 minutes? Probably not. Have I read the email? Probably not. Uh, but I know, I, I'm jesting, but I do, I do think all of these channels are now spawning, as, as we all know. Um, ways of communicating yeah. that are, don't, don't get me wrong, they're very instantaneous, but actually how much they add to productivity and how much they add to closing that um, engagement well, I, gap. Yeah, is, I don't know. I mean, that, but that's what it comes down to, right? There's there's the context of engagement, which is, and, and I, I wrote a blog on this a, a while back, but there's the context of engagement of making sure you're engaging in, in, in the right place at the right time and, and giving the right information, which is where knowledge management spawned from. And we have a community yeah. product that's similar things. It's giving me, giving me the right information at the right point in time and 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 then constructing that in a way that's going to be more personable, that's where an LLM is going to help. But you still need somebody to have the the key understanding of what that knowledge is. I mean, an LLM isn't going to necessarily know how to build a power power plant or it's not going to know how to wire up a, a particular thing yet, but it might in the future, right? So co context of engagement is going to be important. We, we're talking about the, the emails and, the, and, and everything else, but that's almost the engagement of convenience, right? You, you, you have yep. a device in your hand and you can, you can send stuff straight away and you expect answers straight away, but that's the convenient option. And whether that's a conversational AI, whether that's a web chat, whether that's a, you know, an email, people are looking for the channels that are convenient to them at the time that is convenient to them. Yeah. So, uh, this is very American. I'm about to say this, but like, my truck is in the garage right now great big truck uh it's in the garage but the the convenient option for me is they text me when they they, they want an answer or they do something because they know that i'm usually on the telephone or i'm doing something so they just text me so the, the engagement channel of choice is, is sms because it's convenient for them it's convenient for me and, and we're both always on the phone um i know my supervisor at the garage is called erica but i don't think we've ever actually met or spoken on the telephone <laughs> so it's just one example but that that uh convenience is is going to be what most people want i think um and then that's going to evolve in my opinion when you start getting the the llms and the you know the ais and everything else connected into this they're going to have to learn how to do empathy or emotional engagement which you can get with a human and you can usually tell through the engagement so if it is a complex query and you are getting uh, an automated response and it can create a language you know response that simulates that but there's always that nuance of, can I tell? And sometimes a human can, but that emotional empathy is going to be part of that engagement experience. So when I do get to a certain point where I'm frustrated or angry, or I just want to charm somebody to get me a discount on my car insurance, I'm going to phone up, right? So um, I'm going to say, what can you do for me? What, what, what can yeah. I do? And, you, that, and that negotiation you did via letter is now going to be on, on, on the voice because I can, get, I, can, I can garner more empathy that way. It's not convenient for me, but it does mean yeah. I can get an emotional enga engagement then. So, um, so that, that there's that one I think that you can kind of hit into. And then of course, when we say chat, we, we mean social engagement as well because of all of these messaging vendors that have <laughs> spawned in the last eight years on social channels. Um, that's exactly where we want to be connecting. 26, I think, and I actually was on a call earlier today. I learned of another two I'd never heard of. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's a few and then yeah because people want to be able to engage on the social channels they're, they're connected to so you know we, we, we've spoken about whatsapp and, and and others and the reason for that is when we have been banging this drum for a long time is is if my kids are on whatsapp or they're on facebook or well they're never on facebook anymore because that's for old yeah. people apparently uh <laughs> they're on uh, instagram or whatever um that's where they want to engage and and 
as a customer experience, customer engagement, we need to make sure we're connected and, and so on. And the automation, the deflection, the de-escalation, all of those things need to be there in, in whichever form they're going to take, whether that's an automated conversation or whether that's just a, here's a link to the page that you need. As long as it works, it's the convenience aspect again of the engagement kind of switches in and out. So that's kind of the, the four main engagement areas I tend to think about when, when somebody's looking at customer engagement and they, they overlap and they, they map to each other and there are lots of different ways to, to get them working. So. Yeah, and I, and I can't remember the stat you, you threw out at the start, but you know, the, the much, how much of this is, how much is spent on tech and how much is spent in other areas. But the point, and again, it was a <clears throat> customer we are working with at the moment, fairly large global rollout, and picking up on some of those social channels. So, you know, the, the, and the convenience, which is the asynchronous mm -hmm. communication mechanism, which is really, again, another tech term that we talk about. Which is, you know, given that, so you fire and forget and it'll come back to you whenever the response is ready. You don't need it instantaneously. Um, but we put this in yep. place for, for the um, for the customer. But uh, interestingly enough, they as an organization are not ready to actually handle that, particularly from the contact center slash agent side. So really what we've done, we've put an async channel, we've implemented it in an async, but we've actually dumbed it down to run synchronously until they have the ability within the organization to figure out, well, how do we handle this type of, <laughs> of communication? And yeah. it sounds simple, you know, you're, you're truck in a garage and that's a one-to-one, -one, so that's quite simple. But when you scale that up across you know, 100 it or up. whatever, 10 or some 10,000 agents globally, yeah. then that becomes a different matter. Have you seen, have you seen that, that type of thing yourself? So it's not, it was the point, it's not so the actually. technology, it's, it's not the technology, it's more about, how is an organization ready to leverage this technology? Yeah, and and, and that comes back to how do, how do I schedule my workforce for dealing async because it's almost sporadic. How, how do I set my SLAs? These are all the traditional things that come up when you're running a business. How do I measure this? You know, that that's, that's the bit that people tend to struggle with a little bit is how am I actually going to figure out, and you said how to run it, but the, the running it is, is includes not people to man it. That's that's usually the easy part. It's how do I measure these people and and how do I <laughs> how do I blend the the automated in the in the human and when when does it need to get escalated and how much context do they need because they could have pages and pages of history with the with, with with the automated interaction and what references did that person use before they even got to me and it's just lots of nuances to to what they want to do. But yeah, we we've seen that before and, and I even went as far as and this was before pre pre COVID and everything else. It was we were talking to uh, um, a banking customer about video engagements, right? So putting mm. customers in, in in video scenarios so the bank could do mortgage applications and so on in a in a in a shared environment, but online. Um, and it was like, yeah, who's actually going to use this? And then they were thinking, well, we're going to have to redesign the contact center so every every agent has their own little booth that's soundproofed and and all of this other fun stuff and. And then, of course, technology moves on, and now you can soundproof through the audio stream in real time. And there's lot you know you can you can do lots of things to cut noise out and noise cancelling headphones and all the other things. You don't need that, but you do need a nice background, and they'd have to have dressed smartly. And people are like, yeah, yeah, you'd have to do all of that. And then you go through the there was a world world upending pandemic at one point, and now everybody's comfortable in in hoodies and and everybody else, and nobody really everybody found out that people don't really care that you've got a suit and tie on and you work in the bank you can just be my mortgage advisor and it's all good so um yeah we, we it's funny people try to solve the problem like async and and the slas when sometimes it may not actually be a problem to solve it's it's kind of try it see what happens and may, maybe the slas will work themselves out a little bit because you'll see what time of day these things come in and if it's anything like teenage daughters it'll be about mid, at 11 o'clock to midday before they get up anyway so it won't be too much of a problem um but uh they'll never see this just to be clear so this is all good uh, uh um but yeah i mean it, it you can map it out once you start collecting the data i think they'll start understanding how they can weave it into their business and that's it's one of the things i you know the the COVID thing forced people to do video yeah, conversations yeah. and so on and so so everybody had to solve the problem if you sit back and, and I'm not one to sit back and f try and figure it out, I will actively go and try and solve the problem. And so when we, when we did this, we, we just said to them, why don't you just trial it and, and, uh, and just see how it goes. And 
And so they realized that they could actually collect the data and, and it did change how they calculated things, but they were, they were yeah. able to actually get, get that going. But yeah, sometimes you have to force the, force the data or force the problem to find a solution is, is usually my, uh, my thing. Yeah, one, one of my other examples is my horse, horse, horse letting himself out of, uh, letting herself out of her stall, and that forces me to go and figure out how to keep the uh, gate shut on a on a regular basis. But, yeah. Thinkism versus doism, I think map is what we call yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Thinkism um, versus doism. I, I mean, you're you're right, and you know, there's a lot of even if we if we stick with the agent side of thing, you know, there's a lot of this discussion going on at the at the moment around. Again, if we're back to LLMs, you know, are they going to replace agents? Do we actually really need agents? You know, um, again, I'm interested on in your your view there. I, I have a view, but I'm more interested in your view on that. So, are they going to replace agents? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> are they going to assist? Most definitely, because I see the two working hand in hand. But they might replace some of the the contacts that an agent is used to dealing with. I think what the agents are going to have to get used to is getting those more complex inquiries that are harder to answer. They're going to take more time, which changes the concept of, again, the SLA, right? Is It's not going to be a fast one and done and I'm going to get you out of the contact center. It's going to be, I'm going to need a good hour on the on the call or on the chat or whatever, it, whatever channel it's going to be to to solve the problem that somebody's asking me. And I might have to go through seven different channels to get it done because it's it's not going to be a a one one time fix all. So, I think it's going to be it's going to be um, complementary to what people do. Um, replace, I, I think it's a strong word. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to replace a person. I'm going to augment the person's job with with some with some automated technology or autonomous technology, and um, it'll create cost savings for sure. But I think it's going to create a better customer engagement experience overall. That's 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 where I think it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, although interestingly, I did notice uh, just recently, as in uh, today, actually, when we were recording this mid-May, that British Telecom, you'll know from this part of the world, announced mm -hmm. 65,000 reduction in workforce over the next five years. Um, they think, or they are proposing that something like 20,000 of those will be the consequence of using AI. Um, and then there's something well, like a 40% reduction in their global workforce. So that's a lot be, to predict. It, it, that is a lot to predict. Um, it's like one of those Gartner predictions, you know, that, um, yeah. I, you know, I've read so many of them that by 2020 X, you know, certain things are going to happen. But yeah, I mean, obviously, lots and lots of large organizations are looking at the technologies, looking at AI and whether they're seeing it as a mechanism to slim down. Um, or whether they genuinely believe there are real benefits from both the customer perspective, because you know, it is back to your, your point, it's the gap between the customer needs, expectations, and the ability to actually meet those from, from many, you know, across many different mm -hmm. views of that cost being one of them. Well, again, it, it's a bold, it's a bold prediction in my, in my opinion, but um, that could be again re reallocation of, of, of people, right? So yeah, they're going to reduce, but are they going to have to increase somewhere else? That, that part they didn't say, I suspect. Of, of course not. Now, and I, like all of these things, it's touched in, in certain languages, and I thought you know there'll be a certain um, you know uh, tailing off in the workforce anyway, and not be replacement of roles. Um, but I, you know, I, I, yeah. I it, it will be interesting to see how, how some of this technology, particularly in the space that we operate in, the customer experience space. Does actually lead to real um, savings, and actually, and it, it again, we we've both been at this for many years. It's that balancing of the customer experience versus the operational efficiency. On one hand, and again, yeah. the industry has has flipped from you know let's outsource everything because that's much more cost effective. To actually, it's a pretty if I can use that word, customer experience. So let's insource it. Let's have. So I I think that. You know, you're always going to be in this um, balance somewhere between what works for the customer with what's operationally effective. Exactly, and and I think that's maybe what they're they're, they're getting at with their their reduction predictions is there are things that are going to be fully automated and and those jobs will go away, but 
in automating those things, I think there's going to be an increase in other yeah. areas, like you say, and, and that, that's where it's going to balance out. But it's, um, it, was, it was something I saw the other day it was like from the 50s where um, somebody was picketing the fact that something was going to take over their jobs. And as it turned out, they still required them because they needed to make sure that they, they, they were maintaining the, the, the equipment that was replacing them. From, and it became a, they had to reskill these people, but it became a, a, a better environment for them to work because it improved yeah. the quality of, of what they were doing. And, and again, it improved the quality of life. I mean, when you were talking about the automation and, and getting rid of all these people, the one to one of the thoughts that flashed through my mind is is the the movie Wally, um, where everybody's on that spaceship and they're just kind of floating yeah. around because everything does everything for them. <laughs> as long as we don't get to that point, I'll be happy. I think I don't think I could I could cope with that. But, but yeah. I, just, I, just don't feel think, like I, I don't think so, Matt. Although, if we get close to that, it might give you more time on the bike. Um, maybe, and, uh, maybe. I'd enjoy that. <laughs> um, you had a little fall, you were telling me, off air. I did, covered, I yeah. Hope. So, th thanks for bringing that up. So, uh, um, I, was, I was at the velodrome last night, um, and we had a, a 4K time trial option, which I, I recruited myself for. As it turned out, I was the first one to go. And there were other races and, and things that I was signed up for. So there was probably about 50 people in the middle of the velodrome. And I'm the first one up for the first race of the evening. Um, joking around as you do, you know, that kind of thing. And for, for a, a time trial, if you don't know, for a 4K time trial, you get held on the line. So you're clipped in, uh, held, and then there's a, a beeper that counts down from five, four, three, two, one. So you, you get ready, you stand up, you push your weight back and you throw your body forward to kind of start the bike off down a little bit down, down the track. So I did all of that. And as I start to put power into the pedals and I'm, I'm clipped in, so I'm, I'm solid in the pedals. As I start to do this on, on my kind of bars stood up, my right foot came out of my pedal and I, I hit the track. <laughs> Uh, probably doing about 10 miles an hour as I was just starting 30 feet from the start in front of 50 people. And I now have road rash and a, bit, a few bumps and bruises. And uh, thankfully for me, a cup of coffee and some painkillers. So, so, so yeah, uh, it was, it was an experience to say the least, but I managed to get up, go and carry on riding. And then I was able to do a restart because foot out of the pedal on a restart within a hundred feet gets you uh, gets you a restart, something like that anyway. Um, so I managed to do my 4k um i think i came third so it wasn't too bad Pretty but impressive. definitely not the performance i was after <laughs> yeah with, uh, so, with the big hole in my uh kit so, yeah. so you you are well you are i'm gonna say semi-serious i don't mean that the way i come across but you are a pretty serious cyclist <laughs> i mean <laughs> i try i mean I, I try to cycle a little bit but nowhere near the level of but you have not well are you ever going to reach a, a criterium or a, a one-day classic you probably would. Uh, I know you're you're doing. I think you were telling me you're off air as well that you're hoping to make make, uh, make the nationals. Is that is that right? That's what I'm aiming for. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've spent a lot of time uh, training this year. Um, this is probably going. I'm going to be on the bike later, even after the crash, because it, it loosens me up. But um, yeah, I ride anywhere between 150 and 200 miles a week, and I'm aiming to go to nationals in in georgia if i can this year um it depends if i can get my districts um, um events down to the times i need which was one of the reasons i was practicing last night and it uh, didn't happen but uh, i've got three more practices to go before before august so if i can win if i if i get podium you know first second at districts then i will be aiming for a u.s nationals at um, southern georgia um later in the year it's about september time so I haven't got long. I know some of that is dropping weight. Some of that's getting fit. Some of that is, um, and there's a lot of data. Ironically, there's a lot of data involved in cycling, right? So for a, for a 4K time trial on the track, um, you, I have somebody shouting out time splits because I'm not allowed to look at data on the computer while I'm riding on the track. And so that tells me how fast I need to go, whether I need to pick up the pace and, and whatever it is I need to do. For criteriums, you know, closed circuit downtown racing, which I love to do because they're always an experience. Racing past people, having dinner, you know, uh, close close quarters at thirty miles an hour is uh, is an experience. And if you can do it in a twilight where it's kind of just getting dark, it's it's even more cool. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm if I can get to track nationals, that's that's one of the goals. And then next year, I'm I'm going to see if I can aim for the. It's like a three stage race: there's a time trial, a criterium, and a road race. 
Um, road races are not my favorite thing because I'm a big guy. I'm six foot five and I'm built for the track and, and for crits, short, short, sharp uh, uh, races. And I say short, I mean, the last crit I did was an hour long. Um, but uh, road races are a different beast. You know, they can be anywhere between 80 and 100 miles and you're out there for four and a bit hours and I'm not built yeah, for that. I have to yeah. eat a lot of food when I'm doing that. Yeah. No, but if I can get myself fit enough, I, I'll, I will. So, yeah. But I'm on yeah, a team with lots of nationals and, and, and UCI champions and world record holders and, and so on. So I've got a lot of uh, experience to learn from and, and, and figuring it out. And, and last night, one of, uh, one of the UCI Madison uh, Masters holders, who's, who's a friend of mine, he, he was coaching me and calling out my times. And, and um, we've got some improvements to make in my aero position, I think was the polite way he put it. Of, you're not in the right way. You're not, you're not looking good yet. <laughs> Well, I'll I'll be I'll be looking out for you on, on one of the uh, European tours then, or one of the one day. <laughs> I don't think I'll be on a European tour anytime soon. <laughs> the uh, the pa Paris Roubaix or something, oh, so you which... can fit, so, so you can finish on the velodrome and you don't end up hopefully <laughs> going down. Hopefully, with, with Burn, um, that'll definitely be something to look out for. Um, listen, Matt, I'm conscious where we have utilized a lot of your time this morning. It's been fantastic, and I look forward. I know we're catching up in person again soon in, in yeah, a few weeks' time uh, at the yep. the Varent Engage. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, catching up and having a, a few chats, maybe the odd drinks, and we'll be talking about goat herding a little bit more about cycling. Uh, I think we'll leave the AI to uh, to another day then. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank Matt, you for having me, Oliver. It's been great. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I'll chat soon.